first couple of days were tough um, with the strong winds and everything. We hit a mountain, which everybody knows, Mount Etna. And um, it was so steep for just day three into the tour, it was horrible. Um, there was actually, there was a few houses at the bottom with dogs chasing up the, up the road. And it was steep from the start and steep near the end. And uh, it was pitch black by the time I got to the top. It was a long, long day. Were there any big dramas on that one? There was a little bit of tension. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I mean, especially with the, the first one, it's, it, the lads haven't uh, been on a bike together for a couple of years. And um, just say by day four, we sorted it out. Won the Chef of the Year in uh, 2013. He's highly regarded in the in the chefy world, and if you watch his Twitter feed, he's supported by all the great chefs, uh, 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 Ro Rose and uh, Gordon Ramsay's and all this sort of thing. He wanted to be a cyclist when he was a kid. I think he had a choice. He had one of them uh, moments where he had an opportunity to go on full-time cycling, and on the advice of his father, I think he, he went back home. And I think he regretted that, so doing what he's doing, it was, he was just like a little boy every day. Then you've got Doug McKinnon, who's just a, a, just a very generous guy, a business guy who's done really well. Got to his 50s, wanted to change his life, wanted to get healthy, and he started cycling. I invited him to do the Tour de France in 2015, and he raised a hell of a lot of money, and he wanted to go again, and it was his idea of doing all three. James Malt worked in the city for many years, successful. Now he's setting up his own financial boutique, so he had a year off, so he's leveraged uh, money for the charity through trust connections he's got, so he's, he's been a real sort of great supporter. It's very much a team sport, isn't it, cycling? It is, and you don't, I never realised that up until I started cycling. Um, you know, you need protection, especially from the ailments of the wind and the, the, the strong gusts of uh, rain that we're having. So if you're the weakest rider, you know, you, you definitely learn that it, it is a team game because you're, you're dependent of the, the rest of the guys who are uh, surrounding you and helping you get through. Yeah, we got out to France and started well up until about day two or three and I came off with a, a bang and damaged myself pretty badly on my left hand side. <clears throat> that was fine. But then I got an infection in my hip and it just kept on swelling up, swelling up, swelling up. So unfortunately by about day 12, I had to sort of give in. I was, I was devastated because I just felt I had to be there for every single mile. But um, what I realized the day after I got back home uh, to try and recover for, for um, Spain was I'm there for a different reason to the rest of the guys, even though they're raising money. I'm there to promote the cause and the charity and uh, a guy not too far away from us now, Steve Browick, sort of showed his generosity again and more or less doubled the amount of sponsorship and uh, what he'd already give the challenge and it was, it was very humbling. It just, uh, from being the lowest of the low, I was on cloud nine. Again, I, I didn't have time to get on the bike. I was just recovering from the infection and uh, hopefully I was fit enough. And I mean, all the guys were saying the Vuelta was the toughest. And even, you know, the, the, the guy who won it, who won the professional race, Chris Room, said it was the toughest tour he's ever done. And I, <laughs> I totally agree with him. <laughs> what was the feeling like when you crossed the line, the Vuelta, when you knew you'd done all you three? Know, it, was, it was bizarre because I, I, I think it was quite surreal because we, we, we did the touring together in 2015 and I think we were more related then than we are now. Um, because I think we feel like it's a job half done. I think we, we're all now entrenched in the, uh, the cause, the charity and raising the money. And I think we, we all know we've got a duty to, to capitalise on all this uh, news that's coming out at the moment. So even though we had a great night, in, in Spain, we, we definitely celebrated and uh, had a, a good few pints and uh, glasses of the wine. But uh, yeah, I think it's a case of getting down to the serious business now as well, and I think they're all aware of that, which is great. 
how great have the Palace fans been? I was saying earlier on, I'd, I'd somebody texted me the front cover of the programme and I, I just, I nearly, I was walking out of the shop and I nearly had been teared up. But I can't, for me, my illness, fortunately, I can't produce tears anymore. <laughs> so if I could, I think I would have shed a few because I just felt so humble. I thought, oh, wow. Even since 2003, when I was diagnosed with the illness, even though there wasn't Twitter and Facebook, they sent me pages and pages of best wishes from supporters saying you're going to beat this guy. And it meant an awful lot. And ever since that, the support from Palace has never waned. And I think uh, when I needed him again this year, he just stepped up.